everybody. Thank you for joining us in person and on Zoom. Um, I'm very excited that we have Batman here today. That's a first for the library, um, also known as Dr. Scott Reynolds. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled that we're going to have this next program in the Wild Maine series with the Center for Wildlife Studies. Um, we've got another one of those programs coming up at the end of the month, so make sure to check our calendar. Um, and this will be recorded and posted on the Camden Public Library YouTube channel and the Center for Wildlife Studies YouTube channel if you know someone who couldn't be here. And um, also, all the Zoom people, you can feel free to type in any questions you have into the chat or Q&A, and I will read them out loud. Um, and without further ado, to welcome Batman and tell us a little bit about the Center for Wildlife Studies, I'll introduce Jack Hopkins, who is the president of the Center for Wildlife Studies. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, everybody out there here in the audience live and out there in the world via Zoom. Um, before I introduce uh, Dr. Reynolds, I'd just like to say a few things about the Center for Wildlife Studies, the kinds of things that we do. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. We're based here in Maine, but we work throughout the world. We deliver um, uh, online, in-person, hybrid uh, environmental education programs, and we try to do that for everyone. Right. Um, we happen to have this really great partnership with the Camden Public Library called Wild Maine. It's our community program um, and we offer it all year long. We do things here in person um, in the library like we're doing today and also streaming on Zoom. We also get out and take walks and learn about what's going on in our community here. But the focus of this program is to learn about our amazing natural resources. OK, um, so. This is a free program, and if you are interested in learning more about Center for Wildlife Studies, pre please go to our website. We have a couple of QR codes here at the end that you can click on, and you can learn more about us, more about the program, more about how you can support us. And we really we urge you to, to look into those sorts of things, okay? Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Scott Reynolds. Um, Scott is... Uh, He's a new instructor for Center for Wildlife Studies. He's actually delivering a course online here in July about bat ecology, conservation, and management here in the Northeast. Um, and he's a member of the science faculty at St. Paul School in Concord, New Hampshire. He's been there for 22 years. Uh, he's also a founding partner of the Northeast Ecological Services. So this is a biological consultancy uh, focused on the population and conservation of temperate bats. He graduated from Boston University in 1999, studying the physiological ecology of temperate bats, and his current work focuses on the population biology and reproductive energies, energetics rather, of temperate bats, including the winter ecology of hibernating bats. And he's also looking into the potential impacts of inland and offshore wind development of migratory bats, something that is, uh, is in the news quite often about the, the, the detriments of some of these these um, more sustainable energy sources. He works with both undergraduate and graduate students, as well as a variety of collaborators from the state and federal, federal agencies to collect field data needed to make informed conservation and management decisions throughout the Northeast. Dr. Reynolds, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you for coming both in person and um, over Zoom. Um, I'll get started. Um, like I said, I've been doing uh, bat research for, or like Jack said, I've been doing bat research for about 30 years. Um, and it's been a very interesting 30 years. And um, without doubt, I would say it's pretty simple to summarize it as it's been a tough time to be a bat. And I'll get into the details of that. So what is a bat? Um, what is a bat? What do you think makes bats unique? I'm going to have to rely, unless you get questions or responses quickly, I'll have to rely on the live audience. But what makes bats unique uh, either among mammals? They Anyone? Fly. They fly, okay? They're the only active flying mammals that are out there. Anything else? What do you think of when you think of a bat? Echolocation? All right, well, good. We've got the two, the three that I thought were kind of be said sometimes <laughs> do this with other groups and particularly younger kids and you get things you weren't expecting to hear but you hit the two of the three um the last one maybe it's related maybe it's obvious um they're nocturnal um 
And those are really the three things that most people think of when they think of bats. Um, it's not what makes them mammals. And if, as a mammologist, if you're interested in what makes them a mammal, we can get into that. But this is really about just bats. Um, so they, they fly, they're only active flyers. Um, they echolocate. We'll get a little into the physiology of that. And they are nocturnal. <clears throat> um, so among mammals, um, there are about 4,400 species of mammals in the world. Bats are the second most common group of mammals. Um, depending on which taxonomic system you use, is about 19 orders of mammals, and about 21 to 22 percent of all mammals are are bats. What's the largest group of mammals in terms of species? Rodents. So basically, most mammals are rats or bats. Um, but almost 75 percent of most mammals are either of, of rodents or of chiroptera. Um, chiroptera is Latin. Um, the, Two components of the word chiropter, chiro. Any, any word that comes from chiro? Lot, right from what? What's chiropractor? So a practitioner of the hands or with the hands. So a chiropractor uh, means a hand doctor. Um, so chiro is hand and terra um, with a P, with a silent P, P T E R A. So pterodactyl, flying. So they literally means flying hand, uh, flying wing. I mean, sorry, flying hand, uh, chiroptera. Mm -hmm. And that's where the family name comes, uh, the, sorry, the ordinal name comes from. So, um, and, I, and as Jack said, I've been developing a course for, for the CWS for this. And um, probably the most often said thing I say throughout the course is it's impossible to characterize bats because they're so diverse. And then I go on and try to characterize bats. Um, this is what a bat looks like, but again, there's there's uh, over 1,200 species of bats, so it's fairly generic. Uh, but they have some common features. One is this large membranous wing, um, unlike a bird or a pterosaur, a little bit more like a pterosaur, but um, unlike a bird, they have one continuous membrane that goes from thumb to ankle and ankle to tail um, that covers their entire body surface area. Um, they tend to have large ears or point number two that you brought up that they echolocate. Um, this actually is in direct contrast with some of the issues that involve flight and aerodynamics, but you need to be able to see where you're going. Um, other things I've highlighted is the um, shape. If you look at the wing, you can see um, that the literal hand wing comes from there. You see the forearm. Am I stepping off soon? That's okay. Um, you got the upper arm, the uh, elbow, up to the radial ulnar bone, which is a fused single bone. And then you have your wrist, then you have your five fingers that make up the hand wing. Um, and then you have the um, arm wing, the plagiar patagium, then you have the tail, tail wing, the uropatagium coming around the other side. And that's pretty typical for almost all the bats that are out there. You may notice that their knees look different. Uh, their knees are inverted, the knees bend forward. Um, for insectivorous bats, which are the vast majority of bats, um, this can often play a role in capturing insects because they'll actually capture an insect in that little tail basket and uh, while they're flying. It's also a way for them to help give birth. Um, the babies will actually help deliver themselves and land into the basket as the mother sort of bends her knees up to create a cradle for the baby as it's being born. Um, otherwise, that's pretty much it for that. We'll get into the ears and echolocation, just a minute. Uh, they fly very differently from um, birds and what we perceive pterosaurs to, fl to fly from. Uh, because they're mammals, they're heavier. Because of the continuous uh, wing membrane, they have a much different um, uh, loading ratio than, than birds do. And so they fly very differently. Uh, they have much less efficient uh, downstroke and power stroke but they actually do have what's called a um, efficient recovery stroke. So they actually can generate lift on both um, their up and down stroke. And that has to do with their wing flexibility and their ability to change the angle of their wing, something called camber. They can change the camber of their wing with both their thumb and with their tail membrane. And so they can generate lift much, much more efficiently than a bird, but they can fly less efficiently overall. So it makes them... Um, Better at slow speeds, slower at stall speeds. So they actually have the maneuverability and the slow flight speed similar to more of like a hummingbird, but you don't see you know, 90 mile per hour uh, bats like you see with um, 
peregrine falcons and things like that. So sim simple um, solutions to the same aerodynamic problems that you see coming up with bats and birds. What is a pterosaur? I I'm sorry, a pterosaur is a flying reptile. So they're, they're extinct. Um, the three, only three vertebrates that we know that have ever evolved active flight are birds, uh, pterosaurs, and bats. Um, birds evolved active flight from an extension of, I think, the second finger. Um, so they basically have their, their wing membrane and all the primaries come off one digit and extend out. Um, these overlapping, over, um, overlapping interlocking feathers. Um, birds, uh, bats evolved flight through uh, extension of all five fingers, and pterosaurs evolved um, by uh, flight membrane much more like birds, but I think it's off like the fourth finger. So the three evolutionarily, three independent um, evolution events for active flight. Thank you for whoever asked that question. But they're no longer with us. So now we just have bats and birds. So as somebody said, um, echolocation or biosonar is one of the um, adaptations of, of most bats. Not all bats echolocate. Um, we can get into that in a little bit. <clears throat> For context, we hear about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz is our um, perceivable sound range. Um, most bats are echolocating somewhere in the area of about 10 kilohertz up to 120 kilohertz. Um, so some calls are audible to some people. I don't have the best of hearing, I have hearing aids. Um, but a teenage girl and at the peak of her um, pubescent era with her voice and her ears are in line, she can hear down to about um, eight or nine kilohertz. Um, and if you hear them scream, you can tell it's also at a high decibel level as well. Uh, but as you get older, um, your ear deteriorates a little bit, the length of your cochlea uh, deteriorates. So you, you tend to lose our higher end hearing. So our hearing um, tends to decline and we and by the time you get my age, uh, most of us are not hearing anywhere close to 20 kilohertz. Um, like I said, not all bats are echolocating. Uh, we'll get into some of the flying foxes in a little bit. The basic difference between echolocation and vision is that echolocation, they're both part of the electromagnetic spectrum. They're both sound waves, they're both waves. Uh, one's light waves, one's sound waves. Um, light waves gives you a lot of context, shape, color, texture, um, things like that. The big difference between the two is that um, sound is is must be internally generated. So bats are have to generate their essential their signal for them to perceive. We we perceive light through our eyes, but we're not generating that light. Um, the hard part about echolocation is that most organisms who echolocate versus just hearing echoes um, have to generate that sound, and it's an extremely efficient. Navigation system is an extremely efficient sensory system, but the reason you don't see it very often is because it's not economical. It's extremely expensive um, from a caloric and physiological perspective to echolocate, and so you don't see it very often. Uh, where you do see it tends to be in aquatic animals because the propagation of sound through water is much simpler, and so they can produce the sounds that travel long distances at much lower energy levels, um, but really there's only a very small number of animals that echolocate in air, um, and all of them are flyers. Um, so synonymously, you have biosonar, echolocation, ultrasound. Um, these are all sort of using the same idea. Um, there are five orders of mammals that have some species that echolocate. Um, this includes shrews, mice, so um, sort of rodents, some rodents and their allies. Most people probably realize there's groups of whales um, that are echolocating. And there's also two groups of birds that we know of, uh, swiftlets and oil birds that do a very rudimentary echolocation. They basically are clickers. They produce clicking sounds um, and then listen for echoes of those clicks. Um, they're both cave living um, groups of birds. And then there are some insects that echolocate, um, not very many, but there are several orders of insects that actually hear ultrasound and that is, um, very active uh, predator-prey interactions. They're listening for bats, listening for them. So um, many, many groups of insects can hear echolocation. There's only one or two families of moths that I'm aware of that actually can generate that echolocation. And, and there's some interesting research on uh, potential for jamming of interference communication, trying to basically confuse the bats. Um, the jury's still out on 
on how effective that is, but there's clearly some type of um, mutualism and predator-prey interaction going on between them. Here's how it works. Um, the person who developed this was actually a gentleman by the name of Don Griffin while he was at um, a postdoc at Harvard in 1959. And um, there's a whole story about how he discovered echolocation, but it really was just an accident. Um, he happened to work with somebody who had an ultrasonic microphone in their lab and he brought a bat into the lab and the ultrasonic microphone went nuts. Um, but he had figured that, and this is a quote from his original paper, it's likely that bats detect at least some of their prey by hearing echoes of their own chirps bouncing off the insects. Um, and we've since validated a lot of that. So here's the origin of bats. As I said, there's three groups of um, vertebrates that have evolved active flight, the pterosaurs, the birds, and the bats. We don't know a lot about the evolution of bats in terms of um, the stages that led up to it. If, if you know the story of Archaeopteryx, or a version of the story of Archaeopteryx, um, you probably have heard about it. Um, it's this uh, believed to be this proto bird. It actually probably was not, but the story is still a good story to tell. Um, but it's a it's a feathered um, um, dinosaur that that was found, and it believes to have evolved through a series of elongations of the feathers in this ground up approach. And the theory is that these feathers evolved as a, and we know feathers are modified scales. Um, that these feathers evolved probably as either insulation initially, and then evolved as a sort of a broom um, insect sweeping type mechanism. And as they, as they grew longer and longer, at some point they actually gained lift and, and sort of evolved flight from the ground up is the current theory on what Archaeopteryx was doing or Archaeopteryx and its, and its um, succeeders. Um, bats are believed to have gone the other way. They're, they're believed to have actually been a nocturnal tree living mammal that um, developed flight from the trees down, that they're actually already arboreal, um, already nocturnal, already insectivorous, um, and then developed echolocation and flight um, while they're in the trees. The hard part, and there's no resolution on this, is which came first, echolocation without Flight seems expensive and unreasonable, uh, but flight without echolocation seems really dangerous. And so we don't know how they evolved independently, but they had to have evolved um, to some extent um, in synchrony with each other. We just don't see those transitional faunas. There's two oldest fossils out there. Um, this is um, a Carinicterus index from the US. There's also another one called uh, Paleocryptrix tubiodon from Germany. And these are both 60 to 65 million years old and they're perfectly good bats. And before this, there's nothing out there. So we don't see these transitional fauna that would give us some insight um, into it. This, this bat right here, you can see the skeleton, its hand wings are already fully formed. You can see its long forearms, its wings. Um, you see cranium. Um, you can see the cranial space that some have argued already shows um, sort of space allocations that are consistent with low level echolocation and large auditory bulla and things like that. Um, seems like this is a perfectly good bat. And before this, there were no such bats. So we don't know really how they evolved. We just have good ideas. Um, but we do know many things were going on 65 million years ago. We know that um, angiosperm plants, flowering plants evolved 65 million years ago. We know that the flowering plants led to the rapid evolution and diversification of uh, modern insects. We see that in the fossil record um, because these insects were then using the flowers and the flower resources as food supplies. So you had this massive adaptive radiation of insect species. So now you have a huge abundant prey base and you have organisms trying to adapt to that prey base. And um, so this, historically, the argument has been bats sort of went into the night to uh, avoid competition with, with birds, um, but there are actually some bat biologists who find that sort of hiding from the birds to be demeaning. Um, they've come up with some um, birds going into the daytime to avoid the bats scenarios as well. Uh, but regardless, it was a niche that was open, a niche that was available, and bats um, evolved into that niche quite efficiently. Where are they? Well, they're the most, um, and, and I try to reiterate this as well as I talk, um, they're superlative group of organisms. They do more things better than anybody else. And one of those things is they live more places than any other group of 
um, organisms out, out there. They live on every continent except Antarctica and every major island and ocean island chain in the world. So they're found everywhere. And that has to do with their mobility, their ability to fly um, gives them that ability to live anywhere. But they're not evenly distributed across the world. Uh, they're mostly found in the tropics. This is a famous paper from um, Charles Finley. The numbers aren't accurate because the species numbers have gone up since then, but the basic idea is pretty, pretty accurate. Um, in North America, there are 44 species in all of um, Canada and, and the United States, 44 species of bats. You can go to a place in Ecuador, there's a field site in uh, Tupatini, Ecuador, that BU set up about 25 years ago. Um, and on a particular night, you can capture 60 to 65 species of bats in one little field site. And that's 20 more than you can find in all of nor northern half of North America. So they're very tropical centered species mm -hmm. group of organisms. And that's true for the paleotropics as well as the neotropics. Our bats in the Northeast all belong to one family called Vespertilionidae. They're the most species rich um, bats in the world. And this is where they're found. They're essentially found across the entire globe. Um, all, like I said, all 40, oh, sorry, 43 of the 44 species of bats and no, 42 of 44 species of bats in, the, in um, Canada and the US are from the Vespertilionids. They also eat more things than anything else in the world. So most of us are probably familiar with bats being insectivores. About 70% of all bat species are insectivorous. This is a rhinolophid bat from Europe eating a large insect. There are frugiv frugivorous bats um, that eat uh, fruit, eat uh, nectar. I forgot if I did a separate nectar. No, they didn't. So I'm sorry, I should say actually frugivory and nectarivory. Um, so they're eating. Um, Nectar resources, fruit resources from a variety of plants. This is, if you've heard of the term flying fox, these are one of those flying fox um, species eating a, I believe it's a fig. Um, those make up about 15%. There are carnivorous bats. Um, this is uh, Noctilia leparinus. This is a um, bulldog bat, that's a fishing bat. Um, you can't really see the fish, but if you look at its big rake claws, on its toes, it's got a fish in between there. Um, there are bats that eat um, rodents, there are bats that eat birds, there are bats that eat other bats um, as well. There's a bat with a fairly large size rodent, if you think of the body size of that bat. That's the same species, uh, Megaderma, eating a fairly decent sized pastoring bird. And of course, there's our favorite, the three sanguinivorous bats, um, or affectionately known as the vampire bats, the blood licking bats. Um, this is the common vampire bat um, eating, um, licking blood off the um, flipper of a, of a juvenile um, seal. And those are found just in South America, uh, actually into, and into Central America. Where do they live? Um, they live in a variety of different situations. There are bats that live in trees. A lot of species live in trees. Um, so this shows you different bats in tree roosts. Sometimes they're um, on exfoliating bark. Sometimes they're in crevices like in the bottom left. Sometimes they're um, living in excavations that are not made by them as in the top left. Sometimes they hang loose like the fly, uh, flying foxes you see in the top right. And sometimes they're pretty cryptic as you can see this little hoary bat. I don't know if you can see him before, but um, you can see the good coloration pattern. This is one of our bats here in the Northeast. There are foliage roosting bats, bats that don't live on the, on the trunk of a tree, but actually live in the foliage. Uh, these include these disc wing bats in the top left that have little suction cups on their, on their um, thumb pads so they can stick to um, waxy leaves. You have in the middle um, two columns, you have red bats and seminal bats that, that um, are roosting in um, just deciduous trees, one in the fall, you see in the top middle, and one in the um, spring. Uh, the one in the spring is, is actually a mother with her, with her offspring. There's two bats hanging there together. You have tent-making bats in the top right. Um, this is a bat that um, actually makes modified leaves, heliconia leaves, and, and bites the stems to get them to, sorry, some reason it's on a Auto, auto switch. Um, 
that bites the stems and causes the leaves to fall down. They actually make little group tents that they live in for a few months until, until the leaf dies and then they build another one. And then some really cool research that's come out uh, lately with this bottom left one is the woolly bat um, out of Burma. Um, this lives in pitcher plants. Um, so it lives in a pitcher. Uh, the pitcher has fluid in the bottom. So what do we know about pitcher plants? So there's, little, yeah, the, there's, a, there's a water line. So it lives above the water line. But what do we, anyone know anything about pitcher? They're carnivorous. Um, so they're usually attracting insects, trapping insects. And then they have a digestive fluid in the, in the um, water base that digests that insects and they get nitrogen, uh, nitrogen resources from that. Uh, this plant has cut out the middleman. So rather than seeking out insects, it just seeks out an insectivore who poops into the pitcher. And so this woolly bat <laughs> flies around, catches insects, and has this inviting home to come home to and just poops into the pitcher and you have a much easier to digest um, nit nitrogen source. And the coolest part about this whole thing is it actually has what's called um, uh, acoustical fovea. Um, this pitcher plant, that top little leaf that you see sort of overhanging um, is actually um, shaped to concentrate echolocation. So it actually blows acoustically when it is mature as a pitcher and it lets the bat know that that pitcher is there. And before that pitcher is mature, the thing flaps down and it has almost no signature when you, when you hit it with echolocation. And once it matures, this little megaphone or like a, a more like a um, parabolic mirror comes up and lets the bat know there's a um, pitcher ready to go and this woolly plant, uh, woolly bat comes and occupies it. It's pretty cool. And this is this has only come out with a, um, some German research in the last sort of four or five years. Is it where, where are those bats found? This this particular relationship is uh, Burma. Um, it's um, is it one, a tropical rainforest. One species of pitcher plant, or is it? As far, it's one species of bat that at least the research has done. It's called we call it woolly bat. And as far as I know, it's just one species of pitcher that has a strong mutualism. Um, there are house roosting bats. This is probably what we're more used to in the Northeast. Um, so there's several species of bats in the Northeast that are what we call anthrop that use anthropomorphic roosts um, or you know human sort of related buildings, whether they're churches. Uh, bridges, houses, sheds, garages, and this shows you a whole bunch of different species. And the bottom right, bottom left picture is sort of where you can expect to find these things sneaking out of your house if uh, if they live there. Then you have several species of bats that live um, either partially or year round in caves and mines. Um, and there's some of the largest congregations of mammals in the world are some of these cave roosting bats. So here are our bats. Um, 2009 is not because I just haven't updated any of these slides for the last whatever that is, but I want to show you a comparison. So in 2009, this, these were our nine bats. Um, actually, in, in Maine and New Hampshire, we actually don't have that one to the far right, the Indiana myotis. Um, so we have eight species of bats in, in Maine and New Hampshire. And they're, um, look at their... Yellow, they're commensal, so these are house roosting, sort of an association with people. You have um, the northern long-eared bat, so four, you know, tree roosts and rock walls. You have the migratory bats, the red bat, and the silver-haired, and the hoary that are sort of tree roosting with slightly different specialties. But they're all sort of considered pretty common, um, abundant, abundant. Hoary bats just low density because we're on the edge of its range. Uh, Tricolored, we're at the very northern edge of its range, so they're not rare, they're just low density because of range. Um, the small-footed bat at the bottom right was rare because of the habitat it uses. It's a, it's a rocky outcrop species, and so it's endangered um, just because of its rarity of the habitat. Then you go to 2023, and you have um, federally endangered status for two of them, um, one's under federal review, the tricolored bat, and five of them are state species of concern or state endangered, at least in New Hampshire, I uh, presume almost the same status for, for Maine as well. So there's been a lot of um, negative change um, for bats in the Northeast in, in the time that I've been studying these animals. So we'll get into what those issues are in a second, but I want to give you 
um, a quick rundown of what a bat does over the course of a year. This is sort of my thesis work in two and a half minutes. Um, so if you're an adult female, and again, I'm trying to characterize what, what um, you know, 1400 species of bats are doing um, by giving you one example, but this is sort of a temperate uh, migrating, hibernating temperate strategy. If you're adult female, you're gonna come out. Um, so far left, the far left edge of the um, graph is January 1st and the far right is December 31st. So it's a calendar year. The yellow um, is they're sleeping, they're in hibernation. So she starts out in hibernation um, sometime or in March. She ovulates and becomes pregnant. But wait, you say, she didn't mate. We'll get to that. Um, she becomes pregnant. Um, she wakes up sometime in now, um, April, May, probably not April, but May, particularly farther north here, uh, May, early May, mid-May. Um, she'll come out of hibernation. She will give birth. So this was, um, at least I developed this one for the little brown myotis. Um, so in New Hampshire, at least in the colony that I studied for 16 years, um, the mean birth date was June 28th uh, over the 16 years. So sometime in late June, they're giving birth. They're going to, because they're mammals, they're going to lactate this baby till it's um, independent. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, that'll take us to late summer, sometime usually into early August. And she will have to change her, her uh, fur. She'll molt to get a new healthy insulation layer to get ready for winter. Um, she'll have to probably migrate because they don't tend to, at least for little brown bats, they don't tend to hibernate where they spend their summer. So they're gonna have to fly somewhere. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. And then get back to yellow sometime in October, November, um, they're gonna go back into hibernation and sleep for the six to seven months of the year. Um, no access to food, um, basically have to survive on stored energy for that whole period of time. Pretty impressive. And that's why this is why I study adult females and particularly the reproductive energetics of how they manage to do all this and still have energy and time to make babies. If you're the baby, um, I guess technically you don't exist here, that first part. Um, you'd start with, with um, fetal growth uh, from ovulation implantation. Like I said, you're gonna get be born sometime in late June. You're gonna grow postnatal growth, um, a rapid linear growth phase and a slower post-linear uh, post growth phase. You're gonna reach physiological maturity sometime in early uh, August. You have the ability to make sexual maturity if you choose to. Most of them do not, in my opinion, um, and it would data to support that, but they have to do everything else that the female does as well. They have to get rid of their their juvenile pelage and get a new uh, molt. So they have to get sort of adult hair and they have to migrate as well to the same places, uh, presumably the same places that their mother's hibernating to and they have to hibernate. Um, again, huge, huge stress to be able to accomplish all this in the amount of time that they have. And they got to put on enough fat to store um, seven months of hibernation. If you're adult male, it's a little bit easier. Um, you start the year sleeping, you wake up sometime in the spring, you eat, um, and then at the end of summer, you mate, and you go back to sleep. Um, and you repeat that again and again until, until you die. So very few of us study adult males because they're really not that interesting to study compared to the adult females. How many years do they choose to mate that first year? Um, uh, my, uh, because it's too energetic. Um, that they're, they're well, I'll get into a little bit of the data, but the survivorship for the juveniles that first year is much lower. So adult, female adult survivorship, annual adult survivorship, somewhere around 70 something percent for the um, juveniles, it's about uh, 30 to 40 percent, um, just because it's so hard to be born, grow, put on enough fat and survive, and then to add all the costs of, of mating, the timing of all those events and um, energetic stresses of it. Most of them appear to defer a year or two, and I have banding data from my site. Um, the they have what's called phylopatries of females all come back to the same site, so I know, like I don't follow the adult males, I don't follow the juvenile males much either. But all the baby females will come back to that colony. Most of them do not reappear until second or third year, um, and so we're we're fairly confident, quite confident that they're sort of living this male lifestyle for that first year getting healthy, surviving that first year, 
um, building up enough um, experience for foraging efficiency and body fat so that when they actually do reproduce, um, it has a chance. And they can also um, resorb embryos. So some of this may be that they even try to reproduce, but realize the nutrient limitations pretty quickly, and then they can just sort of stop it and just reabsorb the embryo. So we don't see them as reproductive, even though technically they may have tried it and just gave up after a few weeks, realizing that they don't have the energy to go to term. Um, good, good question. So here's what they do before hibernating. So they'll have this fattening period. Um, so a bat um, will gain about five to six percent uh, five or six grams of body fat. This we're talking about a nine gram bat. So we're talking um, you know thirty to seven percent of its total body mass will um, will be added to them, which has huge impacts on um, aerodynamics and flight. They'll fly to a hibernaculum. This is an example of one of the hibernaculums in New Hampshire that they fly to, and then they'll hibernate. Like I said for up to seven months. Um, what we do know about the hibernation. Um, universal for all hibernators is have these what are called periodic arousals. They'll wake up um, at some point, usually, um, not really any usually, but as little as every few days to every two weeks. There's one example of a captive little brown that went 86 days without waking up, but they wake up spontaneously throughout the winter. Um, we know that they urinate when they do this, so we think there's some metabolic um, toxicity sort of byproduct that they're, that they're voiding when they wake up. Often they'll drink, so there's some ideas about dehydration. They're waking up in response to dehydration. Um, as the winter gets closer to spring, they'll recalibrate their endogenous clocks. Um, so they actually wake up on a nightly cycle. Um, they don't sort of free reign, um, like something that would not have any sort of endogenous triggers. What's endogenous? Um, internal to them, so that they sort of can tell time without, uh, without seeing the sun come up or without having a having a watch. Um, but this is really expensive uh, for them from a from an energetics perspective. And they're doing this from October to March with no access to insects, no food source. So it's not like squirrels that can store nuts. It's not like um, bears that can put on 50 pounds of fat. This is a nine gram bat that has to put on enough fat to survive seven months um, and still be able to fly. It can't just crawl to the to the hibernation site with 30 grams of fat on its back. Um, where do they hibernate? Um, not very many places that we know of. Um, we know there's more than this, um, but I survey about uh, eight to 10 hibernacula in New Hampshire every, every year, and that's our known population. Massachusetts only has five, only three of which are of any numbers. Vermont only has five. Um, Maine only tracks three. Um, these are not a lot of places for the entire population to spend their entire winter months. Um, so it really concentrates these these bats and makes them susceptible to issues. And we'll get to one of those issues in a Are little bit. Are multiple species of bats hibernating together? Almost almost all these sites, um, well, now it's a little different because a lot of them are dead. But yeah, before before they all died, every site that I can think of has multiple species in them. And they're different places and different, um, each species has some of their own unique hibernating characteristics. But yeah, you'll go into a into a big site like uh, Mascot Mine is a big one for New Hampshire. So when you go in first, you see Eastern small-footed bats. They like to be near the front where it's colder. So you see Eastern small-footed bats and big brown bats come in. Um, as you get deeper and, and colder into the mine, you'll see um, some Paramyotis uh, tricolored bats that roost singly sort of at around waist height. And then as you get deep into it, you'll see the Northerns and the, and the um, little brown bats. I think the mascot for New Hampshire is the most diverse one. I think at its peak, it had five species, all, all five species that were um, hibernating in the state of New Hampshire. Most of them have two or three. What is the quantity of bats we're talking about? Um, for staying out of New York and, and the one site in Vermont, um, most of them are before it was a tough time to be a bat. Um, our biggest one in New Hampshire was a few thousand. Um, the ones, there's ones in New York that are 50, 60,000, um, Elizabeth Mines and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, you uh, showed us uh, where they hibernate or where they spend their nights when they hibernate. Are the same kind of places or different places? Oh, like the roosting? Yeah. Where do they roost when they hibernate? As when they're hibernating um, 
and again, trying to characterize at least northeastern bats, they're pretty much hibernating on the on the rock faces. Um, so there's, faces. right, uh, these are mines and caves. In New Hampshire, we have no caves, so these are all mines: um, gold mines, silver mines, um, mica mines, lead mines. So they're yeah, all the same places where they would where they would be on a daily basis during the summer. No, uh, we have no we have no cave roosting bats in New Ham in the Maine or New Hampshire that that spend their summers in. Um, Caves. So you get down south, you have the gray bat. Um, the entire 98% of the gray bat population lives in nine caves um, in, I think, three states. So the entire population that's found throughout the entire southeastern United States is only known from nine sites. That's where they, the summer. They tend to find a really good spot and then a whole bunch of them. Yeah, those are big, those are big limestone caves systems. Some of the New York stuff. So once you get onto the um, Templeton Valley side of Vermont, New York, where you have better geology, where they have large um, subterranean limestone um, karst type stuff, then you get these big, huge cave systems and you find 10, 20, 30,000 bats in those. But these New Hampshire ones and the main ones, the smallest one is a place called Mud Mine. It's probably 40 feet deep and you got to crawl, like the name says, you got to crawl through mud to get into it. Um, and it's this putsy little hole. And you know, at its peak, I think there are 80 or 90 bats in there. And the biggest one is mascot, it's a three-level mine that goes about a quarter mile deep, and that was a few thousand. So space is a big is a big thing for a lot of them. What makes the different species of bats choose a different place to hibernate? Um, we don't know, but we'll see the consequences of it in a few minutes. So um, we know bats differ in their sensitivity to evaporative water loss. Um, we know. Uh, they differ in their sensitivity to um, temperature, but we see the consequences of those choices and we're seeing some shifts in behavior because of this disease that's hit, but we don't know. If, if your question is more really like a proximal, like why are they doing this? We don't know. We know the consequences of the choices they're making, um, but we don't know the physiology. There's nothing anatomical. It's not like any of them have you know, weird adaptations that make them more likely to roost in one place or the next. They just, they're making behavioral decisions that have worked over time. And then um, for some species, that's not working right now. That's just a group of bats um, hanging out. This is the group of bats um, under um, infrared light systems. That was a Christmas card my advisor gave me one year. <laughs> Um, this is one of the coolest studies. This is, um, so, I mean, I, I had the good fortune of being in Boston University with Tom Coons, who's, who's probably the, was the preeminent bat biologist in, in North America um, through the 70s through, through 2000. Um, so I was fortunate to be in his lab. Um, and his, his generation before him, there were a few big standouts like Don Griffin. Um, but there's two people who did a study um, that, was sort of, wasn't forgotten, it was, it was a seminal study, but it, they, they didn't publish a lot, but they did this one huge study um, in Maniolis in Vermont, um, Wayne Davis and Harold Humphrey. Um, and it was a four year study. Um, and they basically went to this site in Vermont called Maniolis um, in East Dorset, Vermont. And over the course of four years, they tagged thousands and thousands of bats and then spent um, the summers looking for them on the landscape trying to find out, we know where they're wintering, we just don't know where they're spending the summer. Um, and what they ended up finding was um, that the bats that they were able to band and recover the bands, seven states and um, Quebec, um, 300 miles di uh, radius around this site. So this population was really a 600 mile diameter circle of bats that were all returning to and from this site every every uh, winter, um, and I had, was fortunate enough to actually have all the original field notes of Harold Hitchcock um, in our lab, and I spent about three years actually tracing a lot of these original sites. And um, about ten years ago, I got a letter from his daughter, um, who asked if I had ever heard of him, and I explained to him I have like I have all your dad's original notes, and she was almost in tears to know that like, somebody was still following his research and and that that his work was still recognized as important as it was. So it was, it was a pretty neat opportunity for me. 
So why is it a tough time to be a bat? Um, we'll start with wind. Um, bats hit wind turbines, or probably more accurately, wind turbines hit bats. So I got involved in this in about 2007 um, when we found out, I still remember the meeting I was at, it was at a, a bat meeting in uh, West Virginia and the uh, West Virginia DNR biologist, Craig Styler, came to his own meeting late, um, but freaked out because he had just gotten reports that they found um, 40 something dead bats at this wind site called Mountaineer. Um, the first wind site, one of the first new commercially um, large scale wind projects in Eastern uh, US and, and West Virginia. And we're like, well, that can't be true. Like these are big obvious um, turbines and bats can echolocate so they can see them. We know they hit birds, but birds aren't as smart as bats and birds can be influenced by fog and things where they don't see the turbines. But bats, echolocation is independent of light. It's independent of fog. It's independent, like if there's something big out there, they'll see it. So they shouldn't be hitting these things. Um, but he was right. And I've spent the last 15 years sort of trying to figure out what's going on. And what we do know um, is that it appears to be mostly migration events. Um, so this is data from a site that I'll show you a picture of in a second um, called Flat Rock and um, the Tug Hill Plateau in New York. If anyone's ever heard of this, it's, uh, it's right on the um, eastern side of whatever the easternmost Great Lake is. Um, it's, it's this huge geological abutment. Um, it's actually the snowiest place in the eastern United States, east of the Mississippi. Um, the, there's a town, I forget the name of the town, but the record for that town is um, 19 feet of snow in one winter. Um, not a great place to spend the winter, but everyone basically trades in their cars for snowmobiles. Um, but it's got a lot of wind. It's got a uh, lake effect wind and it's on a high plateau. So it seemed like an obvious place to put some wind turbines. And so this gentleman... That I was working with in 2007, um, wanted to build the largest wind project in North America at the time, 199 turbines in these three little towns in on the Tug Hill Plateau. And so I went out there for two years before and two years after and tried to capture some idea of the bad activity at the site to see what was likely to happen. And what you see is that distribution of, of activity. So all microphones is across all three microphones that we had at different heights um, in red. And you see the blue microphones with the, with the high microphones. Um, at this point, I think they're 60 meters um, above ground and listening for bats. And what we found was that the high microphones were really peaking in late July, August and uh, through September. And that's coincided with, with what we ultimately found out was when they're being killed. So most of this activity is high altitude. Most of the activity actually relates to migration events. And so it wasn't just bats on the landscape that were getting hit. It was bats that were in migration. So it created some concerns. Um, you know, this project was my first exposure, big exposure to wind. Um, these three towns, in the particular a town called Lauville, were depressed towns. These were farms that were closing down uh, because this is just not a great place to farm. It's crappy soil, it's windy, it's cold. Um, so these were beautiful old farms that were just being abandoned. And suddenly someone comes along and offers $15,000 to just put a piece of metal in your backyard and you can still. Um, put your cows under, you can still put your corn in it. Um, and it revitalized these three communities. And it was amazing. Like I said, I was there two years before and two years after they were built. The change in the um, affluence and sort of development of these three towns after these wind turbines came in. So it has a lot of really great potential to, um, to meet renewable energy requirements and transform the economies of particularly um, agricultural habitats and multi-use land use. Um, but it has this caveat that it you know, kills bats and birds. And so we gotta try to figure out what, what is happening. Uh, still a lot to learn, but we have learned a lot in the last 15 years. Like I said, we know that most of this mortality occurs during the fall migratory period. So we know when to be concerned. We know that most of this occurs when wind speeds are below six meters per second. Um, some of that original research came from that site at Flat Rock. Um, we know that most of this occurs on three species. This is the big difference between bats and birds. Um, even though a lot of um, the concern is about birds and wind turbines, uh, bats are killed at a higher rate and that, that mortality occurs among a much smaller group of bats. So three bats are accounting for uh, the vast majority of mortality in, in, in bats. 
Whereas uh, for birds, it's a much lower total number and it's usually distributed across 15 to 20 species. Why so those three species? Uh, these are the three migratory. These, these are the three bats that migrate. Uh, I mean, and I use the term migration in a whole bunch of different contexts. These are bats that behave like birds. They, they live in the north in the um, summer months and they fly south and stay active um, in the winter months. And um, they're taking the brunt of this 85 to 90% of the mortalities for these three species. Um, but we know we can reduce it easily 70 to 90% by something called uh, turbine curtailment. These are smart turbines. You can turn them off and you can turn them on. And we basically now know that if it's nighttime during the fall and it's low wind speed, turn them off. You're not making electricity anyhow. They don't make electricity below five meters per second. They're not generating net income below five meters per second. But historically, they've just let them what they call freewheel. They just let them spin because why not? Well, it turns out the why not is because you're killing things. Um, so if you actually shut it down, you can reduce mortality 70, 90 percent, often with less than 1 percent loss in revenue from um, shutting the wind turbines down. So it's relatively what we would call in the scientific community a no brainer. Um, just do it. Uh, but it's not mandatory yet. And so that's one of the big goals is trying to make this um, a requirement for wind development. The big new push is offshore wind. Um, what would offshore wind do? Um, these turbines can be much bigger. So whereas the turbines you saw here at Flat Rock um, are 1.5 megawatt uh, plate rated turbines, the turbines they're looking at putting offshore are about six megawatts. So each turbine is about the equivalent of five turbines onshore. So you can build less of them and get more energy out of them. And we do know that there's less bat and bird activity out there. So it's most likely to be substantially lower mortality. Um, and who else lives near coastlines? Do you know that bats we do. would be offshore where the turbines are? We do. Um, I, I, I don't have pictures of them, but um, I actually developed a set of blimps to go and chase them off the coast of Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. um, and we found them, we found three species a mile offshore, um, up to 400 uh, feet and above uh, water height. Yeah. Um, there's a guy named uh, Lothar Both out of Germany who's done some work uh, in the North Sea and sees them out there. Um, yeah, we know they're out there, but much, much smaller numbers than, than uh, so they're, they're, they're insects there. We don't know why they're out there. there yeah, it's not a lot of insects. So, um, it's not it's not direct line of sight because they tend to avoid traveling open water um, like birds do. Um, we don't know why they're out there, um, but they are out there um, in small numbers. But it's likely not to be anything like we see on terrestrial sites. Um, so it's very likely this is a great opportunity. But the big, the really big opportunity for the offshore is this is where people are. So if you want to make electricity where the people need the electricity, offshore is obvious. Um, there's no sound issues, really it's just a view shed issue, um, which you know, we're not gonna get around some of the NIMBY issues around that, but um, it's, a, it's a logical place to migrate, um, well, I shouldn't use the term migrate, um, logical place to move renewable energy to, um, and it's gonna have less of a biological impact. Are these losses sustainable? Um, probably with effective and mandatory curtailment. Um, we've seen a lot of losses in some of these species over the last 15 years but there's no evidence with the exception of possibly the hoary bat of any um, redu reduced population size. Um, so it's likely we can stop it and have it be sustainable if we actually require energy producers to uh, do this curtailment. So that's issue one. Issue two, anyone ever? Is it okay? Oh, well, I'll get so quick then. Uh, issue two is white nose syndrome. I won't get into the details of white nose syndrome, but this is a fungal disease. Um, it's a cold loving fungus that came from Europe in 2006, hit New York, um, and it causes real damage to, to hibernating bats. Um, the causative agent is Pseudogenoascus destructans. Um, and what we know about it is that it was first seen at a fairly obscure site in 2006 in New York, um, spread about 400 miles by 2009. That's when it hit my colony in New Hampshire. By 2011, it was in 18 states. And by 2022, this is where we find it. Um, it's across the entire United States. Um, and, and Eastern Canada hasn't made it past the Canadian Rockies yet into British Columbia and Alberta, but we're now coming out of 
another winter season. So we're waiting to hear back from BC and Alberta whether they found evidence of it this where previous did, winter. Where did you say it came from? From Europe. Um, most likely from a spelunker. And that's so, that was in common in Europe for a while. It's, it's endemic. The, the fungus is endemic to Europe. Um, it doesn't cause mortalities like we see. It probably caused mortalities there about 100 years ago. Um, people have always argued why bats are less abundant in Europe, and everyone thought it was forest management that Europe lost all its trees, and now the trees are coming back, the bats are coming back. Uh, but it may likely have been that about 100 years ago, PD hit them, they lost them all, happened to cut all the trees down at the same time, and now they're recovering. Um, and you can do cross uh, inoculations, you can see the European bats do okay with our PD. It's clonally, genetically the same as what you see in Europe. Um, it just got brought over here by mistake and is and devastated. A lunker, like a person? Was Probably a person, yeah, just on a gear. So it's um, it's a fungal spore. It's a highly persistent spore, so it survives um, in on on materials. And probably somebody went into a cave and got got some spores on their backpack, and then went into house cave to just see house cave, and and the um, fungus landed there and has killed um, millions and millions of bats in sun. Person. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I'm, sure, I'm not sure the person knows who they are. I'm sure if they did, they'd feel really bad. But, but the caving community actually has been really cool. Um, when this first came out, um, we worked with the National Cave Conservancy and local caving groups, and they've been really supportive of making sure that their their um, groups are educated about decontamination. So like I said, it kills millions of bats. Uh, it's wiped out most of our bats in the Northeast in the winter. Um, those that survive come back in the summer with substantial wing damage from this fungus, causing tissue damage to the wings. So we're concerned about the survivors but it's really wiped out populations. This is one of my favorite. This is Paddock Copper Mine in New Hampshire with a little stabat slag, ice slag mites. But this is our, someone was asked about numbers in the caves. These are four of our sites in New Hampshire. And you see, they're all doing really well to 2009. They're all going up. Um, and then uh, 2010, 2000, post 2010, um, they all crashed. Here, SARS, we don't have any data past 2010 because the opening collapsed. And so the, there's no bats using it anymore. But even, even um, what are we now, 14 years post um, white nose hitting New Hampshire, our numbers are down to um, some sites two, some sites one bat um, from hundreds. Our biggest site this year is now Ordeon, um, the um, Portsmouth. Um, the bunkers at Ordeon now has 51 bats, um, but mostly, mostly uh, big browns, which are sort of our junk bat. Nothing seems to kill them. They're like cockroaches of bats. Um, and then mascot mine, which has the eastern small footed bat, which is the most resistant, appears to be the most resistant to this disease. But they've pretty much been wiped out. 93% decline across all species um, since 2011. And three of our nine hibernacular are now completely empty. Um, and our total survey count for this past winter was 170 bats. Um, devastating. Not, there's nothing like this has hit any vertebrate group um, in the world. In, in recent memory. Uh, my data from Peterborough, I won't get into it because I'm running out of time, um, but we basically saw this collapse coming. You see 2006, um, you see a positive population growth. These are, these are winter data on the bottom graph from all these hibernaculas through New York, Maine, uh, sorry, New York, Massachusetts, Vermont, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, all of them seeming to do really well. Um, and then 2006 came, and then depending on what state you're in, how far you were away from Howe's Cavern, you saw a complete collapse in most of these sites by 2009. That's when it hit my site in Peterborough, New Hampshire. Um, we saw the same thing happening. So we and modeled, since I had done demographic data on those, we modeled what the likely survivorship of those bats were. And no matter how rosy we made the scenario, we saw quasi-extinction, so functionally ecological extinction within five years. And that's sort of what we, we have since documented. Is there hope? Yes, we're seeing slow and steady recovery at every every state in the Northeast. Um, you know, where we had two bats last year, two years ago, we have four this year, yay. Um, so we're happy, but um, you know, we're still talking about four bats versus 5,000 bats. Um, we're seeing PD showing slightly less mortality as it moves west and south, partly because the winters are less severe and shorter. Um, and it kills them over sort of over the length of winter. We see these random pocket populations that seem to remain healthy. I have a site in um, 
Massachusetts that had 600 bats pre-white nose and had 500 bats post-white nose is back up to 600. And it has to do with probably where these guys hibernate or these ladies, it's all adult females. Um, and we don't know where they hibernate. So, but their behavior, getting to your question of why they choose where they choose, this group of bats is most likely hibernating not in one of these contaminated sites. And so they're relatively not seeing white nose. Um, but we do know that some bats that are coming from these white nose sites are surviving. So there is um, some hope. We also now know a lot more about the northern myotis along the coastline. So they're so bringing it closer to home here. Um, there are these, what we thought were interior forest bats that seem to be found throughout the entire eastern seaboard um, from uh, Virginia all the way up into New Brunswick. Um, small populations that seem to be relatively immune or not exposed to um, white nose and they seem to be persisting. So we're trying to really focus our, most of our effort. These guys were just reclassified as federally endangered a few months ago. Um, and the focus is now not on forest management, but actually sort of coastal management because these uh, coastal populations seem to be doing pretty well. And there are some likely evolutionary adaptations. There's, um, they seem to be surviving and persisting and possibly even evolving to the PD. Um, and there's some fungal treatments on the horizon. And lastly, and I won't get into the big details of it, but climate change is sort of this thing over every, every ecosystem. And for the Northeast, we know that there's going to be changes in timing of uh, precipitation and temperature changes. Um, the IPCC um, projection is a you know, plus two degrees Celsius change by 2050 and a plus four by 2100. Um, some of these are good for bats. The warmer temperatures, if they're in the spring and summer, will allow them to um, reproduce earlier, to um, eat more insects, to grow faster, to get fatter, and may actually help them. Warmer winters, um, is more arguable whether it's positive or negative. The warmer winters means the shorter winters in the context of white nose, it means they can probably hopefully survive. They won't die before the winter's over, um, but it also means that the winters are warmer and they're gonna spend more energy trying to stay in hibernation, thermal regulatory costs. We don't know the net effect, but it's not all negative. Um, there is some good, good things that might come out of it. The big issue may be, um, at least for the Northeast, is if the precipitation patterns hold, um, much drier summers are going to be bad for insects, which means it's going to be bad for bats. It's actually predicted to have more rain in the Northeast under climate change, but most of that rain is actually going to be winter precipitation and, and snow will to convert to, to rain. But the summers, if you look at the far right picture, the summers are actually expected to be drier and that may not bode well for the bats. So I think this is the four W's. I didn't get into... The fourth one, I don't have slides for it because really not much to say, but essentially wood is sort of this um, alliteration. So I could keep them all W's, but you know, forest management and land management, um, urbanization is the other sort of common threat to a lot of this stuff. And some of these things are gonna be good for bats. Some of them are gonna be bad. Some of them are gonna be good for some species of bats. Some are gonna be bad. Uh, we just don't know, but we need to start studying and figuring it all out. And that's where the research will come in. And I'll sort of leave it there. If you have questions on the research or the other stuff, I'd be glad to try to help um, what answer them. What kind of consequential effects have you seen with other ecosystems and vegetation with the decline of the bat population? Like COVID cascades and that type of um, nothing quantitative. Like we're um, we're we're a cute little bat group. People who study bats, our, our bat meetings, our, our regional bat meeting is about. Um, well, they're mostly consultants. You can't even count them. Um, you know, our national bat meeting is a few hundred people. And these are these are the everyone in the world who studies bats goes to these national meetings. And you go to a um, cetacean dolphin meeting. There's like three thousand people studying like nose shape. Um, so as you get into primates, it's even more ridiculous. So the number of people studying bats is really small. Um, that being said, or because of that some of the basic fundamental questions that we still don't know. Um, so trophic cascades have really not been a lot done with that, or I, I think the question is, like, what are the ecological effects we can anticipate from the loss of all these bats? Um, we can make logical conclusions, particularly um, nutrient transfer from aquatic ecosystems to terrestrial ecosystems, because most of our bats are eating emergent insects coming out of the water and they're pooping on the land. So there's literally tons of nutrients coming from aquatic ecosystems and being deposited into forests that's no longer happening. So is a place like Hubbard Brook, 
in New Hampshire are going to start seeing that. Are they going to see slower uh, tree growth rates or things in the soil that they wouldn't be able to attribute to bats, but that sort of changed because there are no longer bats moving literally tons of um, insect debris and in, interior. Um, in other places where they're more pollinating, you know, you're seeing some of the same effects you're seeing with, um, you know, shifts in bees and colony collapse disorder. Um, some is land use. So it's a big issue. Um, if anyone's heard about the squirrel cactus issues. Um, there are a lot of more rotting and not flowering or not um, setting seed and as much as they used to be, and we, they weren't sure why. And it turns out it's because of us, New Englanders moving to Arizona and trying to recreate New England in Arizona. We grow our local flowers and we put out our bird feeders and we put out our hummingbird feeders and the bats are smart. Would they rather go to the guaro tree to guaro tree looking for a little nectar? Or are they gonna park themselves in one of those stupid little red um, nectar feeders and just drink half a gallon of nectar? And so they're, um, going to the nectar feeders. And so the saguaro, saguaro are setting their flowers and no one's coming to visit and the saguaros are struggling because the bats are going to the uh, New England retirees hummingbird feeders. So the Arizona Fish and Game have put out mandates or not mandates requests to don't, please don't feed hummingbird feeders during this you know, flowering season. And, and it was a big issue. It was actually pretty funny um, listening to one of these Arizona wildlife people um, they kept people kept returning hummingbird feeders to the Home Depots in Arizona because they were leaking. They would fill it up in the day and they'd come back next morning. It's empty. The stupid thing leaked. And they'd return and get a new one and fill it again. And, leak. and finally, somebody put a camera out to see what was happening. And there's just lines of Mexican long tongue bats just wow. literally taxiing up, waiting for one to finish. And they just you could watch the liquid level of things drop empty. And they move on. Um, so this sort of how we use the landscape as well, but it's a lot of the stuff we just don't have good answers yet. So with the white nose syndrome, I don't know if there is really any restriction on building bat homes. If a singular bat with the syndrome goes into there, will it affect other bats that go in? Um, so what we've learned fairly recently is that most of the transmission is actually environmental. So bat to bat transmission is pretty minimal. Um, bat to human is pretty controllable. So when we do not so much anymore. I don't have pictures of me. Um, this is pre white nose, so I don't have any hazmat gear on. But for about six or seven years, we're doing the full Tyvek uniforms. Really not convenient when you're going through mud mines and trying to repel and, and these plastic little onesies. Um, but we're trying to minimize our um, chance of us exposing them to white nose. Mm -hmm. um, what we now know is that uh, it's really the fungus in the caves that are reinfecting the bats. So the bats come out of the, those that survive come out summer, fairly low detectability of PD on them during the later summer. Um, then they go back into the cave, touch the substrate again, get reinfected and cycle continues. And if they go to a different hibernacle, it spreads that way. So some really cool studies. I just was reading a study this week about a new um, antifungal called BD23 that um, I don't even know, it never said what BD23 is. I don't know if it's a proprietary thing, but they're mixing this BD23 with, with a um, solvent called decanol, um, which has antimicrobial properties as well. And they sprayed it, they used this sort of atomizer on a carriage down this um, tunnel in I think it was Pennsylvania and um, sprayed this BD23 down this whole tunnel in the, while the bats were there, um, and they did that in 2016, 2017, so about eight years after the initial white nose exposure. And they've seen populations recover um, relative to a control site that they didn't do that at. So there are chances to uh, decontaminate the environment. Um, I've, I've literally advocated at a meeting to go in with a flamethrower and just light up a cave at a mine and just nuke the whole thing and just burn it because this is a cold loving thing and all the little cave huggers. And um, you know the troglobite fauna people were like, "Oh, you can't kill them," and we're like, "Yeah, you can. These are these are mines. These are not natural ecosystems. There's nothing in there but frogs and mites and and these PD. Um, but there are ways to clean these sites, and um, it just takes money and time. So we're hopeful, but they are even without this, they are slowly recovering. But it'll take. I didn't get into some of their physiology, but these are producing one baby a year, so it's going to take literally a century for us to get back with a, with a 
50 to 60 percent survival rate. It'll take literally a century to get back to where we were in 2005. For the populations that are so small, I mean, their genetic pools like must have just shrunk so much. And um, would that goes back to the basic fundamental research that we didn't have a lot of, but what we do know is actually has not affect um, genetic variation much yet, and that partly goes back to that Humphreys and Davies. Um, Mount Aeolus thing. I mean, the, the, your genetic population because they mate, they mate at that uh, Mount Aeolus site. So their their genetic population is that cave, and that cave is drawing bats in from 600 miles away around. So uh, there's still a lot of bats in that 600 miles. So the numbers have dropped down, but it's fairly unbiased in terms of what we think. It's fairly unbiased in terms of genetics. So 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 far, there's no my knowledge of any of those three species that are hit. There's no evidence or concern about recovery and sort of genetic inbreeding or, or lack of genetic diversity. It seems to be. Uh, we do know that there are loci that are more common than they were before, but uh, we're hopeful that's not going to be an issue. But definitely, that's for some of these populations that crash that hard and recover, that's a, that can be a huge issue. Yeah, that's great. Can you see their lifetime? So, um, This is my study in Peterborough. Um, so I was there for 16 years. Um, I captured bats from one to 24 times, individual bats. So my, my favorite female, R667423, I caught 23 times over the, my, my 16 years there before she disappeared, presumably white nose. Um, and she was an adult when I caught her and I have like 13 of her daughters, or no, no, I have 13 of her offspring and I, some subset of her daughters. Um, so the record for this species is 34 years of age. Um, so these are not these are these are bears that are this big. They they're physiologically. If anyone's ever heard like the Kleiber curve or some of these sort of um, size, morphology, and anatomy ratios, um, they fit where a bear should be. They should be the size of a bear with what they do in terms of um, the number of offspring they have per year, how long they live, their, everything about their physiology says they're bears, but they just happen to be nine grams in size. Um, and the record for any bat I believe is 41 years, um, a European bat. So they live a long time if they can live, um, but even still they're producing Almost all the species, probably 80% of the species are producing a single young per year. And all of our hibernating bats are producing a single young per year. The migrating bats, and one of the reasons, hopefully, that the wind turbine issue will not be super damaging to them is those are the ones that are actually producing um, twins, triplets, and even quads. So if they can, babies can survive, they can handle a much higher mortality rate, but they got to survive. We've got to change something about how they survive. We have a question on Zoom from Ursula. Um, bats are viewed as a species that enables virus transmission from animals to humans. Thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to say she's wrong, but she's not. Um, again, superlatives. They they um, because they are so um, adaptable. Um, they seem to be capable of, and 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 particularly uh, because they. Have this physiology that allows them to sleep for months. They seem to be able to harbor thickly viruses um, and not be impacted by the viruses. So they end up being um, non-impacted hosts. They're, they're very seldom are the reservoir species. They're often a um, spillover species. So they're not the source of the virus, but they can get the virus and spread the virus if they come into contact with something like a horse in the case of a uh, Hendra virus. Um, that hit, where was that, Hendra? Hendra is Australia. Um, so it was a virus that has 50% uh, mortality in people, 70 something percent mortality in horses. And it wasn't really an issue until about 2009 because uh, the bats got pushed out of the forest because they got rid of all the forest and the bats moved into sort of suburban and urban Southeastern Australia where their people and the horses were and the bats would poop and the poop would have virus and the horse would eat the grass that had the virus and the horse would die. Um, and it's always been there, but as the bats get exposed to people, um, it's more common. They are big hosts for coronavirus. Um, so um, that was a big concern, but they get 
um, beta coronaviruses. Um, there's actually, I don't think any evidence that they can harbor alpha coronaviruses, which is what SARS and COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID was, um, but they can probably sustain COVID. So our big issue in the last few years with COVID was not that they would die of COVID, that we would, that we would get COVID from them. No evidence that can happen. We've tried to inoculate. I mean, I haven't personally, but I speak as a community. Uh, we've tried to inoculate them with COVID and they don't get it. Um, we've tried to have them transmit COVID and they don't appear to be able to do it. Um, our big concern was that if a researcher like me went into a site um, and had COVID but didn't know yet or was just ignoring it and um, got the COVID into a bat, that because they wouldn't have the negative effects of COVID, they could actually become a natural reservoir. And so it could evolve in the in this Peterborough colony, then five years later, it could come out as a nastier form of COVID and, and spread back to humans in a, in a human spillover. Um, so there is that risk. Um, they have been implicated with COVID, but really isn't, wasn't the bats. It wasn't um, this Rosetta's bat that made the pay, papers. It was really this pangolin. If I've ever heard of a pangolin, it's this really weird um, anteaterish type thing. Um, and that's the primary, appears to be the primary reservoir for COVID in, in the um, wet markets of China. But they're, you know, they're eating bats, they're eating pangolins, and they're selling all this stuff in wet markets next to each other. It's um, actually in the, I just finished the lecture for Jack CWS course on epidemiology. This is, this is um, influenza, Hong Kong influenza market all over again, just for COVID, that Hong Kong and certain Chinese markets have these three conditions for a mega outbreak. They have a highly virulent virus that's natural, whether it's coming from initially from a bird or some other reservoir. Then you have a mammal, in the case of influenza, it's pigs that are living there in the live markets. Um, and, and for SARS and COVID, it's you know bats. And then you have humans interacting and it creates this potential for um, these, particularly these invasive proteins, the H and the N from the H1N1, um, nomenclature for influenza to create these massive diseases that will be brutal. Um, we haven't seen it for the coronas, but it's a legitimate question. But uh, there are good people working on it. There's no reasonable reason to be concerned. There's no real evidence that uh, bats have been any big player in any of that stuff, but they do, they do have a really hardy and effective immune response. And um, that seems to make them capable of having a whole bunch of diseases without being impacted, similar to rabies. They actually can get rabies. Um, they don't really have a lot of the symptoms of rabies, but they can transmit rabies. Well, that's all we have time for. But awesome. Thank you so much. That was thank you. Sorry I went long. No, no. Well, good. Thank you for joining us, everyone on Zoom. And this will be recorded on the Camden Public Library YouTube channel.